So who is this guy sitting on the grass, uh, you know, with the five loaves and the two fish, the son of God? Um, we say that, but it really, it takes a lot of effort on our part and prayer to really get this into our brain. It was hard for the people back then. It's difficult for us now to see a guy who looks like a man and think that's the incarnate Logos. The divine Logos, the Son of God, equal to the Father, consubstantial with the Father, shared the glory of the Father before the creation of the cosmos. That's who's sitting there on the grass. It's really hard to get that in our little peanut brain. So every day I try to hit the refresh button, reboot the computer, try to get this in, reappropriate it, interiorize it. It's, 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 it's yeah. It's one thing to think about God as some God of the philosophers up there. You know, that's much easier for me to just think of God in an abstract way. Uh, yeah, this being, yeah, sure. Uh, that's all knowing and omnipresent and so forth, all powerful easy uh god the father yeah all right i got that that's fine uh but now you put god in uh in a human nature and you're like that guy right there telling me looks like everybody else that's god okay uh that's tough the incarnation is tough and yet that's the essence of christianity it's the essence of our catholic faith is we got to get those two things together what this miracle is all about divinity and humanity and bring them together it's hard though they resist each other and and when you get them to plug in when you plug in the faith it's like plugging in a christmas tree to the wall the whole catholic faith comes alive it looks sad and dreary until you do that uh, then it's like, bing, you know, during Christmas season, when you come downstairs and see your Christmas tree, doesn't it look sad over in the corner until you turn the lights on? That's how people look at the Catholic faith. Because they don't realize the Son of God was walking around down here. They see a man in the grass sitting there. Yeah, he's a charismatic religious leader, great moral teacher, uh, prophet maybe, nothing more. Uh, we got to get it through our little peanut brain, who our Lord is. And for him, this is easy. This miracle, easy. I mean, who is this guy sitting there? Uh, he's the one that uh, 13.8 billion years ago created everything out of nothing, our whole universe. And I want to just talk about physics stuff for a second because I want to have some fun with this. We're going to do a little science. I, 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 don't, I don't have much uh, formation in science. I, I ain't never had no physics class in my life. I took uh, earth science, um, chemistry. I remember, I, I, I know I didn't get an A, I'll tell you that much. Uh, but look, physics, let's talk physics because uh, uh, I think it's fascinating. I mean, this is settled science. The universe started 13.8 billion years ago. Okay, we know from, we've been able to measure the expansion rate of the universe. You just got to rewind the tape. We're, we're, it's pretty solid. Okay, within okay, plus or minus 100 million years. So we know how old the universe is. Most of human history, they haven't known. They just had to assume it must go back in, eternally in the past. We don't know. Uh, now we know. Okay, and it's settled. Uh, and we know the age of the universe. It's amazing. And it's Pretty much a consensus on that. Uh, and we know the things approximately 100 billion light years across. They can even estimate the mass of the universe. I mean, it's just unbelievable how we are able to get our head around that with, and show it with scientific equations and stuff. I don't know. Uh, and there are these four cosmic constants. Um, you tell me if you remember this stuff from high school or college. The fun, four fundamental forces, you know, the gravitational, the electromagnetic, the strong and weak nuclear forces. Raise your hand if you remember that from different stuff you studied in school. No one over here in the main section of the church remembers the four fundamental forces in class? Wait, wait, do that again. 
Yeah, one, there's two over there. Anybody smart over here? Yeah, there's three over here. They got you over here. All right, look, uh, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know, I couldn't say one intelligent thing about the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force. I don't even know what it is, but I'm saying it anyway, because I heard smart people talk about this on YouTube. Now, uh, <laughs> but uh, here's something that's pretty solid though, what we know, the more we learn about the origin of the universe, it's unbelievable. Whoever had their hands on the dials, like everybody, even, even including radically, radical atheists like Richard Dawkins, all of them are scratching their heads because this thing is so dialed in, the fine tuning of the universe is so fascinating. If it's off the slightest little bit, there's no life in the universe, no possibility of life because there's no possibility for hydrogen or for the other things we need. Uh, everything has to be just right. And we could have any number of different conceivable uh, formulations, you know, of these four uh, fundamental forces. Uh, so whoever dialed it in, had their hands on the dial, knew exactly what they're doing. Some of these things, like the strong and weak, weak uh, nuclear forces, if you had the fraction, okay, point, and then 40 zeros and a one. That's how small we're talking, a fraction. 40 zeros with, with a one, all right? After the decimal point, if it went up one degree higher or lower, the universe would either burn up or freeze out, okay? There's no possibility for life. You can play around as soon as you start fiddling with any of those four constants, those four fundamental forces, there's no possibility of life. Um, and this is, this, this is mind boggling how perfect our universe is. Here we are, 13.8 billion years. This is like the habitable age. It took a long time to season it and get it ready for life. Okay, uh, it takes a long time of preparation to get it to this point. We're like, how come it took so long for God to make this whole thing? Why is the universe so old? Because that's how long it took to get to a habitable age period in the history of the cosmos that could support life. It takes a while to get it to the soup to kind of cook together the spaghetti sauce, you know? You got to leave it on the stove for a long time and let it simmer. It took a long time to get it to this point, to be in this habitable age of the cosmos. And here we are in this habitable zone of our galaxy, the Milky Way. There's a lot more dangerous neighborhoods we could be in, man. We are in this like spiral arm on the outside fringes, kind of in the suburbs or whatever. We would not want to be in the inner city, okay? There's some really dangerous neighborhoods. Uh, in our galaxy that we would not survive in. Much greater likelihood of destroying our planet. Uh, so we're in a good, safe zone, habitable zone of our galaxy and of our solar system here. Man, a little bit further away from the sun or just a little bit closer, either burn up or freeze out. And our planet is just big enough to support our atmosphere. Look at Mars, it's just a little bit smaller than us and they couldn't hold it together. Their atmosphere, they presumably have one at one point, but they lost it, pretty much most of it is gone. Uh, the majority of it, because it's not big enough, it doesn't have enough gravity and just it heated its core and, and magnetic magnetism or whatever to just fend off all the solar wind that's hitting it and just ripping the atmosphere off. Man, we have just enough of all that stuff to like hold down our atmosphere. We have enough water and sulfur and all these other elements needed to support life. It's like perfect. It took 13.8 billion years and you need a universe 100 billion light years across to make a place like this for us creatures like us to live in. Unbelievable, folks. And then you add the moon to the equation, keeping us from wobbling and giving us our tides and our season and our ordered climate. I mean, the whole thing, it's, it's amazing how dialed in it is. Who had their hands on the dials? 
A guy sitting on the grass. A guy sitting on the grass with five loaves and two fish. Easy for him to perform this miracle. That guy? You know how smart that guy is? Unrestricted knowing powers. We're so impressed with ourselves, our little areas of expertise, you know, but it's very compartmentalized. You know, we can only know, you know, become experts in one given area as soon as you stray out of it. I mean, I feel like a knucklehead listening to these guys on a computer, you know, talking to these famous cosmologists and physicists and astronomers, and I listen to them and they could blow my doors off. I, if they saw my GR, GRE score in math, you know, they would just laugh. Uh, yeah, couldn't even follow the, my last, I don't even want to go into my math career, oh my goodness. Last class I took in math at the University of Delaware, Algebra 010, wasn't even credited. It was just a class like to get you to where you could take other classes to actually obtain credits, college credits. And I got a C. Or, uh, <clears throat> I'm not very good at math. So look, man, these guys, I'm so impressed by them, but uh, you know, I'm listening to a panel of them and they're published in peer reviewed journals and blah, 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 chairs of this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like real impressed with it. Then they start talking about religion or something, and they start to wander into my area of expertise. They, said, they suddenly sound so dumb. I mean, no insult to high school kids, sorry. But they have like a high schooler's grasp of these things. I'm listening to them, I'm like, oh man. Oh, it's kind of uh, violent to see them swerve out of their area into another area and they suddenly don't sound very smart and I'm embarrassed for them to be honest with you listening to them um, yeah God doesn't have any limitations like that I don't know go to the ocean sometime and think the smartest person that ever lived smartest person take a little thimble go down to the beach and just dip a little thimble and like, that's our brain uh, and then look out at the ocean uh can't imagine what this being's like. Sitting on the grass. Knows everything there is to know all at once without a struggle for all time. Not even just what is in its to its fullest extent. I'm talking every scrap of data in the universe. Everything. Even our inmost thoughts and feelings. Like knows us better than we know ourselves. How many hairs are on our head. Everything there is at all. Can you imagine the data bank? all at once without a struggle for all time. Yep, and even what's possible, even what's possible. Everything, every possible universe, every position of those dials, whatever he wants to do, everything that's even possible, God knows all at once without a struggle to its fullest possible extent. That's what we mean by unrestricted knowing powers. That's who's sitting on the grass, holding the five loaves and the two fish. Awesome to think who Jesus is. We barely have the foggiest idea who he is sitting there, nor those who are gathered around his apostles. And the people in the crowd, they have no idea who's sitting there. Nothing more interesting has ever happened in the history of the human race. Then the incarnate Logos walked around down here. Then the Son of God came down here. That ought to be sizzling and crackling in our brain every day. That's the front, should be on the front page of our minds. The top headline of our hearts every day. How amazing this is that God walked around down here. Be struck with fresh wonder every single day. Try to get that into our little peanut brains. Cut through the fog and get it to register. When we do, we'll see our Catholic faith and all the sacraments come alive. When we realize who's behind them. When I stand at the altar and hold that bread and say those words, we realize Christ, the Son of God, is saying those words in, in and through me as his secondary instrument. He's the primary agent. Easy.
for him to do these things when we know who he is. So I want to make a finish with one simple point here from a great philosopher, theologian of the 20th century, Romano Guardini. It's an amazing priest. Wrote this famous book called The Lord. Anyway, I, I like how he makes a certain distinction about Christ here in this context of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, our Lord's miraculous powers. Listen to this. What for mortals, even for those far advanced in faith, must remain an unspeakable miracle to just multiply five loaves and two fish and feed a crowd of 5,000 men and count you know, all these women and children as well. Man, even with advanced faith, seems like an unspeakable miracle. But for him, Gordy says, it's but the natural expression of his intrinsic being. It's not remarkable or extraordinary at all. It's easy. The natural expression of his intrinsic being. For us, it's supernatural. Oh my goodness. Wow. For him, it's natural type of being that he is totally different utterly separate and different from us Christ himself does not believe isn't that a funny thing way to put this he doesn't believe he doesn't have faith our Lord doesn't need faith he doesn't have to believe to believe Christ himself does not believe he simply is who he is God's son. He doesn't need faith. He just is. Uh, to believe means to share not what Christ believes, but what he is. See, that's what faith gives us access to reality, to what is truly the case, to the reality of who Jesus is. And we come in contact with that reality through faith. He, our Lord, is that reality that faith is seeking and trying to grasp hold of. He doesn't need to do those things. He just is. He doesn't need faith. Oh, it's a really cool distinction, isn't it? Feel your little tickle in the back of your head? Feels good. Uh, what the believing soul experiences is not a truth or a value, but a reality. The reality of God in the living Christ. Faith is the act of seizing this reality and of building one's life on it, of becoming part of it. The life of faith demands a revolution in our sense of reality. Daily, earnest exercise of faith is what alters our sense of reality. Experience of genuine reality must be our aim. I love that. It's kind of like the metaphysics of faith here. What we're trying to reach out and see through the eyes of faith is reality itself. The author of that reality is sitting on that grass today. And when he takes up five loaves and two fish, and sees a crowd and wants to feed them with it. Easy. Easy.